This stress-free moment's brought to you by Lewis Jewelers. Thank you to all the frontline and essential workers that have made it possible for Washtenaw County and Ann Arbor to open again. Welcome to the Wolverine.com podcast. I'm Clayton Safey with Austin Fox here on the Maze in Blue Breakdown. And this week, we talked to college football expert Phil Steele. You, you've heard the name. Everybody knows it from his college football preview magazine that is in stores now at Barnes & Noble, Books A Million. You can get it online at philsteele.com. And we interview him. We talk about Michigan, uh, what he sees, what he foresees out of this Michigan Wolverines team in 2020, what the schedule could look like, what it would be if Michigan played Ohio State earlier on in the year, based on some reports that are coming out, all of that and more. We get into it with Phil Steele, a full Michigan football preview with the expert. But first, we want to remind you guys to subscribe to TheWolverine.com. Use promo code BLUE60. You get 60 free days of all of our premium content at TheWolverine.com on Michigan football, Michigan basketball, recruiting. Promo code BLUE60, two months for free. Secondly, sign up for the Wolverines daily and breaking news newsletter. Go to bit.ly slash um newsletter, all lowercase today, and sign up. You get breaking news sent straight to your inbox. You get all the daily headlines sent to your device so you can never be left out of the loop whatsoever. And finally, subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen. Give us five stars and leave a positive review. And last thing, I promise, head to the wolverineondemand.com. Get your copy of the Michigan Football Preview magazine. But without further ado, here is Phil Steele with Clayton Safey and Austin Fox. All right, we now welcome on a very special guest, Phil Steele. You know the name from the magazine. He's all over the place. College football expert, has a Heisman vote. Um, you can get his college football preview magazine, the Bible for many college football fans, available at philsteel.com, in stores at Barnes & Noble, books a million. Uh, I've dug into it quite a bit already so far, but and just so much information. Um, but, Phil, I want to start you off. Like, we experienced it. We wrote the Wolverine Football Preview Magazine with so much uncertainty heading into the 2020 season. How was it for you putting this one together? It's definitely a little more unique than usual. Yeah, it definitely was. And in fact, uh, you know, when we write the magazine, it's so in-depth. It's a six-month process. We do the uh, first write-through for each team uh, starting the Sunday after Thanksgiving, and that's usually a process that goes November, December, and into January. The second write-through process then begins in February once all the uh, freshmen have signed and the players have declared early for the NFL. And uh, then the third write-through process is always after I talk to the coaches. Well, Normally that happens in March and April, but uh, the state of Ohio shut everything down, so I was coming to an empty office every day, and I was even wondering if we're going to print a magazine this year. But once uh, once they opened it back up, the staff came back in fully charged. I started talking to the coaches, talked to 110 of the 130 head coaches out there this year, and uh, I got fired up. The coaches were mm-hmm. uh, pretty much saying, hey, you know what, next man up. You put the ball in the field, we'll be ready to play. We don't care if we didn't have any spring practices, we'll be ready to go. And so we uh, put the magazine out later than normal. It went out uh, July the 8th as opposed to the end of May, but uh, we got the same amount of great information in it. And the, the big difference this year you'll see with the magazine is that Normally, we're everywhere. We print a couple hundred thousand of these things, and we're in grocery stores, every bookstore. This year, it's exclusively Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, and we only printed 50,000, so we print about one-fourth of what we normally do, but Barnes & Noble and Books A Million exclusively. Yeah, and the fact that you were able to pull it off and and get this one out this year is much to the delight, you know, of college football fans, and if we're able to have a season, which we hope we can, that'll be much to to the delight of, of fans as well. Um, so we'll talk about some Michigan football here. We'll talk about, you know, in the context in the context of the Big Ten. But uh, was there anything that surprised you or stood out to you after talking to all of those coaches, um, something about the Big Ten maybe, or Michigan that stood out to you um, that, you know, maybe you didn't think of, but after some conversations, after some you know, digging into some research that you, you were able to find? Uh, I think, uh, you know, with the Big Ten, uh, 
nothing that I wasn't prepared for. I think probably the team I'm highest on for the biggest surge in the Big Ten this year is Northwestern. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, going through the team with Coach Fitzgerald and uh, after uh, looking at all the players, I mean, remember last year Northwestern actually had a top-20 defense, and uh, despite their 3-9 and nine record, their problem was offensively. They couldn't get anything going. They have seemed to have solved that offensive problem by bringing in Peyton Ramsey from Indiana. And uh, other than that, they're a veteran team. They've got the most veteran team in the Big Ten, 19 returning starters coming back. You know, they returned 73 lettermen, and they only lose 17 from last year. And as mentioned, that defense was a top-20 defense uh, led by Patty Fisher, and they got nine starters back on D, both defensive ends back in Miller and Brown. I think Northwestern is a team that's going to surprise folks uh, this year because, uh, you know, they were 3-9 and nine last year, but this is a team that was 15-1 and one in Big Ten play the previous two years. It was actually in the Big Ten title game just two years ago. Yep. This is kind of the million-dollar question in regards to Michigan this year, but do you see this team getting better quarterback play with either Dylan McCaffrey or Joe Milton than it did under Shea Patterson last year? Uh, I think there, the possibility does definitely exist. Now, Shea Patterson, remember the first play of the year last year, he seemed to get injured and wasn't the same in the first half of the season. Got better in the second half of the season. The numbers were adequate, 56%, 23 touchdowns, 8 interceptions. Uh, but uh, I do think that whether it's McCaffrey or whether it's Milton, the possibility does exist to improve upon those numbers uh, clearly, especially when you got receivers like Nico Collins and Ronnie Bell, tight end Nick Eubanks. Uh, the, the possibility it does exist this year. Gundier had not not literally, obviously, folks. I mean, we're over <laughs> the phone here, but who do you see winning that job? And and you know, it, will that good enough? You know, will that possibility that they're better than Shea Patterson? Will that be enough to be one of the upper echelon quarterbacks in either the Big Ten or, or the country at large? Well, I think the Big Ten's got pretty good quarterbacks, uh, so it'll be interesting to see. I went with Dylan McCaffrey in the magazine, Edge and out Joe Milton. I think, you know, if you're looking at these guys as far as arm strength and straight line speed, you're probably going to take Joe Milton. But, uh, you know, Dylan McCaffrey's a guy who I, I feel is smart, uh, cerebral. He's a hard worker. I think he's well-respected by the team. And, uh, you know, maybe not the arm talent, uh, but I, I think when you look at McCaffrey at 6'5", 220, he's a guy that can hurt you both running and passing. And I'm pretty excited uh, if he does indeed win the job. Now, my big question is, how are they going to protect him? They lose four NFL uh, offensive linemen off of last year's squad. So the offensive line, a little bit of a question to me. Yeah, and that was actually going to be my next question is, okay, you look at this offensive line and, when we were breaking it down early in the summer, we're doing our football preview magazine. We're saying, okay, if they can get past Washington, they had a couple games, Ball State and Arkansas State, where they could get up to speed, uh, you know, home games against some cupcake-type opponents. But now it's a Big Ten-only season, um, and we don't know exactly the order of the games or what, what days they're going to be on or how long training camp's going to be. Obviously, a lot of questions still going into that, but – for you, what's the difference between not having a couple of those non-conference games before the Big Ten slate starts, and 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 now they're have you know they're going to be thrown into the fire here in Big Ten play? Yeah, and I th- I think this is around the country this year. You want experience, you uh, because lack of spring practices. Now, as you touched on, lack of non-conference games, it pays to have an experienced unit, especially up front on the offensive line. So you wonder how quickly they're going to come together. Now I know Ed Warner back at Ohio State, when he was the offensive line coach there, did wonders with inexperienced offensive lines. But, of course, he had spring practice to work with, and he had the normal routine. So I I think that's going to be the big key. Now, frankly, I felt Michigan's offensive line underperformed a little bit. They have four NFL guys on it and uh, put up the numbers they did. I thought they underperformed a little. They do return Jalen Mayfield back this year. Warner's got experience in building teams, but I do think the loss of spring practice and the loss of those non-conference games could hurt Michigan at the start of the year. Mm Mm-hmm. How do you see this uh, Michigan running back group playing out? Do you think one single guy could potentially emerge, or do you think it'll be more of a by-committee approach with guys like Charbonnet and Hassan Haskins and Chris Evans? I think it's definitely going to be a running back by committee. Uh, Charbonnet, uh, as you know, led the team in rushing. I thought Haskins was the most effective back in the second half of last year once he moved over from the defense. But you got a Blake Corm coming in as a true freshman. 
Uh, he's a kid that uh, wouldn't surprise me to have him see the field this year. Christian Turner is a guy that's explosive and strong. And then getting Chris Evans back is a big key. So I imagine if one guy emerged and was averaging six yards a carry and demanded the ball every time it would happen. But I think when you've got five running backs like that, uh, they're going to play more by a running back by committee this year. We saw one year of, of Michigan's offense under Josh Gaddis, and it was rocky at times. And, you know, we kind of talked about how they underperformed in some aspects. They got better as the year went on, especially the passing game with Shea Patterson and Nico Collins and those guys. But what's your impression after one year of Josh Gaddis being in full control of that offense and, and heading into year two where, you know, a little more continuity, and I know players have talked about how much more comfortable they are, but uh, your impressions heading into year two of the Gaddis era with Michigan's offense? Yeah, and I think you hit it right on the head. I mean, you go in the first half of last year, and that offense struggled a lot. And then in the second half of the year, all of a sudden, you know, I think once you got to the uh, the second half of the Penn State game, it looked like a finely tuned machine, uh, and they were putting the points on the board. And I think now that Gaddis has been there for a year, everybody's familiar with the offense, that's going to be a big key. I love the skilled players that Michigan has back. Once again, my biggest question mark is going to be that offensive line. The offensive line's got to come along, protect the quarterback, open up holes in the run game. But I do think Josh Gaddis' system will work. And I like Josh Gaddis as the offensive coordinator. I think he's going to do a good job there. Mm-hmm. Let's move into the, the defense a little bit. I want to ask you about what Michigan has returning and, and what you think of some of those top guys. So they lose quite a bit of production. You know, you lose Jordan Glasgow and Uche and Kalik Hudson in the, receive, or in the linebacking core, excuse me. Uh, Michael Dwumfor at D-Tackle, Lavert Hill, a talented corner who was productive at Michigan. Um, but what do you like about what they have coming back? You see some guys that are going to probably step up, like Ambry Thomas and Aiden Hutchinson, Quiddy Pay are still there at defensive end. You, just your thoughts on some of the top returning players Michigan has on that defense. Yeah, I like the defense, and I like all three units. In fact, all three units rank in my top 25 in the front of the magazine. You start up front <clears> – <throat> To me, the defensive line is the strength of the, uh, the defense. You got Quiddy Pay and Aiden Hutchinson at the defensive end spots, and then you got Carlos Kemp inside. And then watch Chris Hinton. I think he's a guy that can uh, step in there and, and have a big impact this year after getting his feet wet as a, uh, a freshman last year. So, offensive line, I rate number nine in the country. Like the talent they have there. Defensively, I think getting back a player like Josh Ross is going to be a big plus. Remember, Ross had uh, 61 mm-hmm. tackles despite starting just one game in 18 and had a red shirt last year after starting the first three. Getting him back, I think, is a big plus. Added with McGrone at the linebacker spot. And then in the secondary, Ambry Thomas uh, can be a shutdown corner. Brad Hawkins is a, a guy that's a very physical at the strong safety. Daxton Hill is one of the team's fastest players at free mm-hmm. safety. So overall, each of those three units uh, I'm high on. I think Michigan, as usual, will have one of their top-notch defenses. Mm-hmm. You mentioned you mentioned Josh Ross. I, I totally agree. As he's kind of the forgotten man there coming back from injury. But, yeah. I yeah, actually, physical. Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say physical, athletic. I, I think he's a guy that really is going to make a big factor. you got to like 6'2", 232 at the linebacker spot. Mm-hmm. As for that defensive end duo with uh, Quiddy Pay as a senior, Aiden Hutchinson as a junior, do you see that as the best defensive end duo in the Big Ten, and could it potentially even be one of the best in the country? Yeah, there are some pretty good defensive lines in the country. Uh, you know, you go to, like, uh, Miami of Florida. They've got uh, uh, Gregory Rousseau, who last year had 15 and a half sacks as a redshirt frosh at one defensive end spot. And then they had Quincy Roche, who was the American Conference Defensive Player of the Year at Temple. Uh, and he had 13 sacks at the other defensive end spot. So that duo is uh, going to be pretty potent. I think Penn State's got uh, some very capable defensive ends. But uh, I actually list Quiddy Pay and Aiden Hutchinson, both on my first team Big Ten. So best set of defensive ends in the Big Ten, I'm going to say yes, Michigan. Yep. Uh, going back to Dax Hill a little bit, we saw some flashes of him and when Hawkins was hurt at the end of the year. He stepped in and was able to, to start and, and play, you know, productive minutes and play productive snaps for Michigan. But just how good do you think, you know, compare him to some other guys in terms of making that jump from the freshman year to his sophomore year. Obviously a former five-star recruit, somebody that was very highly touted coming out of high school. But what do you think that jump is going to be like for him? What's the learning curve there? And is it going to be a, a big leap? 
Yeah, I think it will be a big leap because, uh, as mentioned, he's one of the team's fastest players. Uh, and I like the fact that he got on the field late last year, started those last three games, and was highly productive when on the field. And he's a guy, I mean, when you're the number two rated defensive back coming out of high school, you have high expectations to begin with. I think Michigan fans probably thought he'd be starting a little bit earlier than he did. But once he got up to speed and got rolling, we see many times uh, players in their second year just make that drastic jump. And he's got the athletic talent you want. He's got size. He's got speed. And uh, I'm, I'm looking for a big year from Dax Hill. Mm-hmm. Are there any uh, under-the-radar guys on this Michigan roster that you think could really step up and surprise some people around the country next season? Yeah, maybe a guy like Michael Barrett. I mean, uh, you know, Barrett is a guy that's 227 pounds. He, he runs a 4-5, and he could step into that Viper role. As you know, the Viper role is pretty impactful. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I think Chris Hinton's going to make an impact this year. I thought Michigan uh, went more with an undersized defensive front last year and, and at times got run over a little bit. Hinton brings the bulk that you like to have inside. And uh, he was one of those, you know, we talk about Hill being my number two rated DB out of high school. Chris Hinton was my number five rated uh, defensive lineman out of high school. Got in one start as a true frosh. I look for him to make the same type of leap that I expect out of Dax Hill this year. In in terms of those, some of those breakout candidates on the on the offensive side of the ball, what, what do you expect out of Giles Jackson, Mike Thain, or still guys like that who, again, they were guys that showed flashes as freshmen and really showed that you know dynamic type of, of style of play that Josh Gaddis is looking for. What, what are your thoughts on some of those guys on the offensive side of the ball that could really um, break out for Michigan? Yeah, I think, you know, Giles Jackson is one of those guys that can clearly uh, break out because of the fact that, uh, you know, he's a 4-4 guy playing in the slot. If you're a if you're a defensive coordinator, you got to worry about Nico Collins. You got to worry about Ronnie Bell. You got to worry about Nick Eubanks. You got to worry about those running backs. He's probably the one guy that maybe you get a lot of single coverage on, and yet he's a he's got speed. He's like a 4-4 guy. He could take off and go. Another guy to watch is A.J. Henning, the true frosh. He's another 4-4 guy that uh, has got great ball skills, great short area quickness. So I think he's a guy that can step right in and make an impact as a true frosh. Those would be you know, two guys that I think, with all the attention on Collins Bell and Eubanks and the running backs, that are all of a sudden going to emerge this year. Okay, I like it. Um, we see these early NFL mock drafts kind of coming out for, for 2021, and a few Michigan guys will, will have their name on the list, but who in your mind is the most NFL-ready Michigan player right now? Uh, I'd have to go uh, maybe a, uh, it's probably between Quiddy Pay at defensive end and then Jalen Mayfield on the offensive line. We've seen the offensive line produce a lot of NFL guys. And uh, I think he would be right up there as as one of the top prospects. Uh, you know, you also have to throw a Nico Collins in the mix at wide receiver. There's there's some good NFL candidates on this squad. Mm-hmm. We've we've talked about the strengths and weaknesses so far a lot about on this Michigan team. But what do you think is the single biggest strength and the single biggest weakness on this team in 2020? Uh, I'm going to say the best strength is going to be that defensive line, uh, and it's a it's a Don Brown defense. So you know they can dominate. I like the ends. I like what they got inside. So I'm going to say the strength of the team is a defensive line, and I, I like line play. But my biggest question mark is going to be that offensive line. How do you rework the offensive line, losing four guys to the NFL and uh, coming from a, an underachieving uh, squad without the spring practice? So it's it's actually. You know, usually you've got a lot of strength at the line of scrimmage. There's strength and weakness at the line of scrimmage, I think, with Michigan. Or let's say strength and question marks with Michigan at the line of scrimmage. And this one is more of a big-picture question, but it's something that Michigan fans ask all the time. What does, uh, what does Jim Harbaugh need to do to finally close that gap and beat Ohio State? Or what are a few of the key things, at least, that he needs to improve on? Oh, boy, they definitely uh, – you know, I think adding team speed – and there has been speed added on the offense. Uh, I thought last year one of the keys to the game was, you know, naturally the inopportune turnovers, but then also getting pushed a little bit out uh, up front on the D-line. I think adding a little more size on the defensive line is is a plus this year. But, uh, you know, the, the talent's 
not that far away. I just thought Ohio State had a, a little bit of a speed edge last year and maybe a size edge up front, and I think those things have narrowed this year. But uh, i got to tell you, I'm not projecting Michigan to beat Ohio State this year. Well, you did it. You did it last year. Can you explain? I guess you know you, you said, and you were you know not alone in that. Michigan was the favorite to win the Big Ten, but um, can you explain a little bit? I guess just what went into that decision, and then and then what your feeling oh, was coming out of that season. Yeah, absolutely. You know, going in, I had question marks with Ohio State last year. I mean, Ohio State had a brand new quarterback, which uh, you know Justin Fields, and and I guess the questions from Georgia that I was hearing was. Can this guy read defense as well? Uh, the, another question was the offensive line. They only had one starter back. Another question was the defense. Ohio State's defense in 2018 gave up 403 yards per game, which was the worst in school history. And so even though they had uh, a good amount of starters back, you're wondering how good is that defense really going to be. They lost a Hall of Fame head coach in Urban Meyer, replaced him with Ryan Day, who was a first-year head coach, and they had to travel to Michigan. Meanwhile, Michigan had been close to Ohio State some in previous years and uh, looked like they had a veteran offensive line, one of the best offensive lines in the country. No such questions at the quarterback spot. A Don Brown defense, the new offense coming in with Josh Gaddis, and as mentioned, they got the Ohio State game at home. So all those factors had me pretty doggone excited about Michigan's chances of finally breaking the bubble. And then Ryan Day steps in and just amazing. I thought Ryan Day did an amazing job last year. I mean, Ohio mm-hmm. State in 2018, they needed a stop two point conversion to get by Maryland. They got blown out by Purdue 49 to 20. They were nip and tuck with Penn State in the fourth quarter, nip and tuck with Nebraska in the fourth quarter. They were far from a dominant team. Last year, they just flat out dominated everybody they played. Offensively, defensively, stepped on their throat all game. No close games. I thought that Ohio State last year, even with all the those question marks I had about him coming into the year was probably 10, 14 points better than the 2018 version. So hats off to Ryan Day. He almost won my coach of the year honor. Uh, I thought he did a phenomenal job last year. But all that went into it, and really I felt pretty confident that uh, mm-hmm. with all those question marks Ohio State had, this would be the year that Michigan would get them. But maybe that window closed a little bit last year. Yeah, and you were not alone in that whatsoever. I, I think there was a lot of high hopes coming into last season for Michigan. But I wanted to get your thoughts on the potential Big Ten schedule because, in, you know, it's conference only. It's very unique. But now the rumor is, okay, that they might front load the schedule with some of those divisional games. So Michigan would, would likely be p- playing like a, a, an Ohio State at some point in the first half of the season. You'd be playing Michigan State, Penn State. Um, but in terms of on the field, what does a Michigan-Ohio State game look like in – October, um, as opposed to at the end of the season, like is like it's traditionally played. Yeah, it's the best rivalry in college football, and it's it's always in November. But you know, I tell you what, guys, as strange as it would be to see them play in the September or October this year, I'm mm-hmm. just gonna be damn happy to be watching football in the fall. Yep. So I'll take it this year, and uh, yep. I'll worry about the tradition and all that stuff in future years. But let's play football and play it in the fall this year. And that'll make me a happy guy. And I don't care who they play and when they play, as long as they're playing football. I'm with you there. We obviously don't know the new 10 game schedule quite yet, but any updated projections on what you think Michigan's record should be this year? Or is it a little too early to make that prediction quite yet? Yeah, I think it's a little too early. I need to see the schedule, see when everybody's playing and where they're playing. And, you know, you have to factor in less of a home field edge this year. So I I almost think that we're going to see more road wins from teams than we have in the past. But, uh, yeah, you know, I'd like to see the schedule first, then I'll make the projection. But, But right now I feel pretty good that it's going to be Ohio State number one in the Big Ten East, Penn State number two. I think those are the two most talented teams in the East. And I've got Michigan number three. You have Ohio State as your national champion. Um, some of our listeners maybe you know want to put on earmuffs there, but um, <laughs> tell, tell the people who your other college football playoff teams are and, and why you chose them, why you think that they're going to head to that final four. Hopefully, knock on wood again that we have it. Yeah, I went way out on the limb here, guys. I took uh, out of the uh, ACC. I went with Clemson. Out of the Big Ten, I went with Ohio State. Out of the Big 12, I took Oklahoma. 
And then, believe it or not, in the SEC, I actually went with Alabama. So uh, way way out on a limb with my final four this year. I think it's pretty much universal. Everybody's got going to have those guys in their top four. But I'll say this. I think college football, there's less of a gap this year. You look at the ACC as your poster boy for that. Uh, last year, the ACC was Clemson, a Grand Canyon, and then I don't even know who the second-best team was in the ACC. Whereas this year, it's the most improved conference in college football. You look at North Carolina, Miami, Virginia Tech, Pitt. I think they're all legitimate challengers. Notre Dame being tossed in is a legitimate challenger. Yep. Florida State's going to be improved. and So I think the ACC is the most improved conference. With Ohio State, Penn State's actually pretty close to them talent-wise. Penn State has got a lot back, and you know, going over the team with Coach Franklin each of his seven years, you go back to his first year there, they had walk-ons in the two deep, and they were coming off probation. This year they go three deep with highly touted players at every position. That's a loaded Penn State team. And then Big 12, I think Oklahoma's going to have their hands full with both Texas and Oklahoma State. And even in the SEC, hell, Alabama didn't win it last year. They finished number eight in the country, and mm-hmm. they've got to battle teams like Georgia, Florida, and my dark horse this year, which is Texas a and Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I have Oregon actually in my in my final four, so I think there is some, nice. some possibility um, that the gap is closing in terms of maybe we'll see a Pac-12 team again in there, or you know maybe we'll see Notre Dame knock off Clemson in, in Charlotte at the end of the year and, and make the college football playoff out of the ACC, which would be wild in in a season like this, but kind of fitting for for a crazy year that that 2020 is. Um, last question for you. If you had to make one bold prediction surrounding Michigan football heading into this 2020 season, what do you think that would be? A bold prediction? Boy, I'd like to see yeah. the schedule before I made a bold prediction yeah. on that. Uh, all right, we'll, we'll say this. I'll say the uh, uh, the quarterback uh, passing stats will be improved over last year. They'll finish higher in the QBR than they did last year. Okay, I like that one. I like that one. I think people will be happy with that for sure, Michigan fans. Uh, Phil Steele, thank you so much for coming on with us. We appreciate it, and let's do it again sometime. Hey, it sounds like a lot of fun. And remember, if you're out looking for the magazine this year, yep. only Barnes & Noble and Books A Million. Don't waste your gas driving to all the other places that you've got it in years past. Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, or philsteele.com. That's S-T-E-E-L-E.com. But, uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun talking football with you guys today.